In this video, we're going to be talking about Stokes theorem. And Stokes theorem is just a higher dimension version of Green's theorem. So where Green's theorem only helped us in two dimensions, Stokes theorem helps us in three dimensions. And the cool thing about Stokes theorem is that it relates the line integral to the surface integral. So you'll recognize that you have the line integral on the left side of this Stokes theorem formula. It's the line integral with the vector function r, the vector field f, over the curve c. And on the right hand side, we've now got a surface integral that includes the curl of the vector field f and the three dimensional surface s. Now when it comes to the Stokes theorem formula, there are a couple things that we need to define. First, we need to say that S is an oriented smooth surface. So when we say oriented, we mean that it has a direction in terms of the way it faces. It faces up or it faces down. Normally, we want it to face up, but it really depends on the relationship with the direction of the curve C, which we'll get to in a second. But either way, the surface S, it has to have an orientation. So it's an oriented smooth surface that's bounded by a simple closed smooth boundary curve C. Notice here that we have the surface S and we have the boundary curve C. Now in order to use Stokes theorem, the boundary curve has to have a positive orientation, but that relates to the orientation of the surface. So in this case, the surface is oriented up, which makes it simple. When that's the case, we're looking at the surface from above. So we're up here, we're looking down at the surface. What we want to see is a counterclockwise direction for the curve C. So C has a direction. It can either move counterclockwise or it can move clockwise. If we're up here looking down at the surface and the surface is oriented up, then that means that C needs a counterclockwise direction because that's what we call a positive orientation for C. If it's oriented clockwise, then it's going to be a negative orientation. So we want this positive orientation for C. And one easy way to remember that is to think of yourself walking in the direction of the curve C. So we know it has positive orientation, which means we're going in this counterclockwise direction. If we're walking in the direction of the curve C and our head is pointed toward the direction of orientation of the surface, so in this case the surface is pointed up, our head is pointed up too, and we're walking in this direction, the surface will always be on our left hand side. If all those conditions are met, if we're able to set up the surface in this way, then we can use Stokes' theorem. So let's go ahead and do a couple examples. Now the great thing about Stokes' theorem is that because it relates the line integral over the curve C to the surface integral, and these two things are equal to one another, we can just evaluate either way. So when you're tackling Stokes' theorem problems, you're either going to be given the information on the left side of this formula, and then you'll need to find the value on the right hand side, or you're going to be given the values on the right hand side of the formula and you'll need to find the values on the left hand side. So we can go either way. Notice in this case for this problem, we've been asked to find the value from the left hand side of this formula here. That's a hint to us that the information that we've been given is going to be the information from the right hand side. The first thing we want to do is get an idea of our surface and our boundary curve C. So we've been told that S is the hemisphere with the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9, where z is greater than or equal to 0, and the surface has an upward orientation. So as a matter of fact, that is just about what we drew before. We have the hemisphere that's sitting above the plane z equals 0, so it's sitting right on top of the xy coordinate plane. It's just the upper half of the sphere and we know we've got this formula for the sphere. So that's obviously the sphere with radius three. The key then is to find this boundary curve C. Well, C runs all along the bottom of the hemisphere because we're saying that the surface is defined by this equation but cut off at the plane Z equals zero. That means that the curve C is gonna run along that plane Z equals zero along the edges here of the hemisphere and create the boundary for it. So if we want the curve C, what we need to do is plug Z equals zero into this equation here. And when we do that, we're just gonna drop this Z squared term, and we can say that C is given by X squared plus Y squared equals nine, when Z is equal to zero. Now remember, we are looking for the information from the right side of this Stokes theorem formula. So we just looked at the curve C, but remember on the right hand side here, this dr, r is the vector function, which means we want to parametrize this so we can get it in terms of a vector function. 
Because x squared plus y squared equals 9 is a circle with radius 3, and that makes sense because c here is just the circle centered at the origin in the xy plane at z equals 0 with a radius of 3, that means we can parametrize this as the vector function r of t is equal to, and then because it's a circle, we always do the radius times cosine t for x, so 3 cosine t. For y, we do the radius times sine t, so 3 sine t, and then we already have a value z equals 0, so we get z equals 0 there. Now because we've got dr here, we're always going to need to find the derivative of the vector function, so we can go ahead and do that right away since we're here. So the derivative, when we take the derivative of 3 cosine t, we get negative 3 sine t. The derivative of 3 sine t is 3 cosine t, and the derivative of 0 is still 0. Now the last thing we need, because we're going to be evaluating this integral on the right with respect to r, we need the vector field f in terms of the vector function r. So what we want to do is plug this vector function r into our equation for f of x, y, z. So what we want to say there then is f of r of t is going to be equal to, we'll take our three values here for x, y, and z, and plug them into f of x, y, z. So 2 times y there, y is 3 sine t, so we get 2 times 3 sine t, and then we're multiplying by cosine of z, which is just going to be cosine of 0. Then we want to plug r of t into e to the x sine z, so e to the x is going to be e to the 3 cosine t, times sine of z, so times sine of 0. Then we just need to plug into x e to the y. Let's go ahead and move this out of the way. So because we have x, we'll get 3 times cosine of t, so 3 cosine of t. And then we have e to the y, so we'll get e to the 3 sine t, so 3 sine t. We want to simplify that, so here cosine of 0 is 1, so we're just left with 6 sine t. Sine of 0 is 0, so that whole term is going to become 0. And then here we can't simplify any further, so we get 3 cosine t e to the 3 sine of t. Now with this information, the integral here on the right hand side is going to become the integral from 0 to 2 pi because, in fact, when we parametrized the curve into the vector function r of t, remember this was the circle here, so what we need to do is define t over the interval 0 to 2 pi. So we would say t is the interval 0 to 2 pi. Those bounds get translated here into the integral, and then the dot product here of f dr is going to turn into f of r of t, which remember we already found, and the dot product of the derivative of the vector function, r prime of t, dt. And notice we already have all of these components, so we can just plug them in. So we'll have the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And let's go ahead and take the dot product now. So we have f of r of t, so that's going to be this value here. And then we have r prime of t, which is going to be this value here. So we need the dot product of these two, which means we take the x values and multiply them together, then add the product of the y values, then add the product of the z values. So here, when we multiply negative 3 sine t by 6 sine t, we get negative 18 sine squared t. So negative 18 sine squared of t. Then we're going to add to that the product of the y values. Well, down here we have y is 0, so when we multiply that by 3 cosine t, we'll get 0. And here we have z equals 0, so when we multiply 0 by 3 cosine t e to the 3 sine t, we'll get 0 there as well. So here we'd have negative 18 sine squared t plus 0 plus 0. Obviously we don't need to write those, and so we just have dt. And from here, we're just evaluating the integral. We'll make a substitution for sine squared of t and replace it with 1 half times 1 minus cosine of 2t. And so then when we grab our negative 18 and our 1 half, we get a negative 9 out in front, 0 to 2 pi 
and we're just left with 1 minus cosine of 2t dt. When we evaluate the integral there, we'll get t minus 1 half sine of 2t evaluated over 0 to 2 pi. When we plug in there, we'll get negative 9, and then here, plugging in 2 pi, sine of 2 times 2 pi is sine of 4 pi. Sine of 4 pi is 0, so no need to subtract 0 there. But then if we go ahead and plug in 0, we'll get 0 here for t, we'll get sine of 0, which is also 0, so we really just end up with 2 pi minus 0 minus 0 minus 0, or just 2 pi, and that's going to give us a final answer of negative 18 pi. Now that was a really standard example. Here we're going to go the other way with Stokes' theorem. We've been asked this time to find the line integral side of the theorem, which means we're looking for information from the other side of the theorem. We've been told that the curve C is the triangle with vertices 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, and that C is counterclockwise when viewed from above. So again, we want to sketch the surface if we can. Here we're looking at the triangle with the given vertices, and we've been told that C is counterclockwise when viewed from above. So again, we're up here looking down, and C is counterclockwise, which means we're in good shape because that's the orientation we want for the boundary curve C. Now remember, we have our Stokes theorem formula, and we've been asked to find the line integral side of the formula, which means we've been given information from the right-hand side of the formula, or we need to find it. So the first thing we want to do is tackle the curl of the vector field F. Well, we've been given F here, so finding curl is just an application of the formula for the curl of F. So we'll go ahead and say that the curl of F is equal to, and remember we have our 3 by 3 matrix here, we have I, J, and K. We have the partial derivative with respect to x, the partial derivative with respect to y, and the partial derivative with respect to z. This is all going to be of values from f here. And then we're going to take x, y, and z, the coefficients on i, j, and k, down here into this third row. So we're going to have x plus y squared. We're going to have y plus z squared. And we're going to have z plus x squared. Now remember, when we evaluate this matrix, we're going to evaluate it this way. We've broken it apart into 2 by 2 matrices, and now we need to find the coefficients on i, j, and k. So here we're going to say partial derivative with respect to y of z plus x squared. Well, since there's no y term in there, the partial derivative is 0. Then we're going to subtract whatever we get when we multiply the opposite way. So here we're going to say partial derivative with respect to z of y plus z squared is going to be 2z. Then for j, we're going to say partial derivative with respect to x of z plus x squared is 2x minus the other multiplication. Partial derivative with respect to z of x plus y squared is 0 times j. And then here for k, partial derivative with respect to x of y plus z squared is 0. Partial with respect to y of x plus y squared is 2y, so minus 2y. K. And that's going to simplify to negative 2z times i minus 2x times j minus 2y times k. Now here's where things get a little tricky when we're dealing with something like this, a triangle with these vertices, instead of just the equation for a curve. Here's what we have to do. We have to recognize that curl f is given by p times i plus q times j plus r times k. And so then what we want to say is that p is equal to negative 2z, q is equal to negative 2x, and r is equal to negative 2y. Then what we know is that this value we're trying to find here, this right-hand side, the double integral over the surface s, curl f dot product ds, that that's actually equal to the double integral over d, where d is the projection of this surface we're interested onto the xy plane, we'll come back to that in a second, of negative p times partial derivative of g with respect to x, and we'll come back to g in a second, minus q times the partial derivative of g with respect to y, plus r times dA. Okay, so we just threw a lot out there. We already know p, q, and r. They come from the value we just found for curl. But what's this function g? 
Well, G is going to be the surface, the plane that we're interested in. Remember, we looked here at our triangle. This surface is going to be part of the plane X plus Y plus Z equals 1. This plane right here is the plane that intersects the x, y, and z axes all at x equals 1, y equals 1, z equals 1. So this surface is part of this plane. If we solve this equation for z, we get z is equal to 1 minus x minus y. Now that we have z as a function of x and y, we can just rename this and call it g of x, y. So we'll say g of x, y is equal to 1 minus x minus y. Now this function g is what we're talking about when we're saying the partial derivative of g with respect to x and with respect to y. So we're going to be able to easily find those. We already have p, q, and r. So all we have to talk about here is this d. And remember we said d was the projection of the surface onto the xy plane. Well if we go back to our picture here, and we think about this as the plane intersecting the coordinate axes at x equals 1, y equals 1, z equals 1. And we just think about what shadow it would create on the xy plane. Its shadow would be this little triangle right here. And this little triangle would have the vertices 0, 0. This would be 1, 0. And this would be 0, 1. And that'll be the projection d. And we'll come back to that in a second. For now though, because we're trying to find this double integral over the surface S, all we have to do is plug into this double integral over here on the right. So we'll go ahead and say that that's going to be equal to the double integral over the region D. Here P, we already know, is negative 2Z. So we're going to have negative, negative 2Z times the partial derivative of G with respect to X, which is going to be negative 1. Then we have minus Q, which we know is negative 2X, so negative 2X times the partial derivative of g with respect to y, which we know is negative 1, and then plus r, which we know is negative 2y, so plus a negative 2y, so we have minus 2y, and then we have dA. When we simplify that, what we get is we have three negative signs here, so that's going to end up as a negative 2z. We have three negative signs here, so that's going to end up as a negative 2x, and then we have a minus 2y dA. We want to then make a substitution for z. Remember that z was 1 minus x minus y, so we're going to get double integral d. When we multiply this negative 2 by each term here, we're going to get negative 2 times 1 is a negative 2. Negative 2 times a negative x is a plus 2x, and negative 2 times a negative y is a plus 2y. Then we have minus 2x minus 2y and dA. Now notice that we have a positive 2x and a negative 2x, a positive 2y and a negative 2y. So all we're left with is double integral over the region D of negative 2 dA. And we can go ahead and factor the negative 2 out of that. So the result then is negative 2 double integral over the region D of dA. And this is where this method really gets cool because this double integral here over the region D of dA in fact, this whole thing right here just means the area of that projected region, that shadow, on the xy plane. So if we go ahead and bring back that area, we're talking about this region D right here, this shadow. So that thing that we boxed, then, this here, this is just the area of that region. Well, remember, that region was a triangle with side lengths 1, so it was a 1 by 1 triangle. The way to find area of the triangle is 1 half times base times height, or 1 half times 1 times 1, which of course is just 1 half. So the area of that shadow, the area of that projection, is 1 half. So this whole thing is going to become 1 half. So our result then is going to be equal to negative 2, this negative 2 here, times 1 half the area of that region. And negative 2 times 1 half is just going to be equal to negative 1.